you all a Colorado Happy Pollinator Month. As you may know, PPAN asks the governor to designate June as Pollinator Month each year. And so this is a time to celebrate our pollinators, but we also want to take concrete actions to protect our pollinators. And really what better way than by creating biodiverse, pesticide-free habitat. We want to have a succession of blooms throughout the growing season and really work hard to uh, build habitat because we know we need it very desperately. And we're very lucky to have a panel of experts today to break this subject down for you and lead you through some of the steps it takes to create a really great pollinator habitat. This spring, PPAN co-hosted a successful series of free pollinator plant exchanges on the Front Range. And we plan to co-host native seed swaps in the fall. It would be great to see more of these events because they are such a great way to share plants for both new and seasoned gardeners. So please do stay tuned for them. And let me know if you'd like to get involved because lots of hands and seeds and plants to share make these events a success. And this webinar is being presented in conjunction with the Fort Collins Xeroscape Garden Party and pollinator plant swap that took place this past weekend. The one in Denver that was the weekend before and they both had lots of attendees and lots of plants were passed out. So that's really exciting. Just want to mention a couple of events coming up in the next couple of days. We have Pollinator Month celebrations taking place uh, with the Colorado Pollinator Network at the Denver Botanic Gardens tomorrow, and one on Saturday at the Gardens on Spring Creek in Fort Collins on Saturday. And we do still need some volunteers for the event on Saturday at the Gardens on Spring Creek. So please reach out if you'd be interested in lending your hands to that event. And then lastly, on Sunday, PPAN will be at an Earth Day Remastered event in Wash Park in Denver. So come see us at one of those events. And I really wanna welcome our presenters. We have Laurel Starr, who is a pollinator advocate from Golden, Aaron Michael of Earth Love Gardens and Jax McCray of Remedy Permaculture. So you're in for a real treat with this engaging and informative presentations that are coming up. And we'll be leading off with Laurel Starr. So Laurel, will you please take it away? Thank you, Joyce. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Joyce, for what you're doing to bring this topic of pesticide use in the nursery trade to everyone's attention. And thank you to the other panelists today, Jax and Lindsay and Aaron, for creating biodiverse landscapes which aren't dependent on pesticides. Before I tell you all what I've learned about pesticides in the nursery industry, I want to acknowledge the work of Kelly Marco with the Lakewood Sustainable Neighborhood Program. Kelly's been compiling an annual Be Safe nursery list for many years. To create her list, Kelly's been calling her local West Metro nurseries to inquire about their pesticide use practices. She then prints up her findings and shares her list with concerned plant consumers so they can be steered towards nurseries with best practices and find the safest plants for pollinators. This year, with Joyce's encouragement, Kelly decided to expand her list to include more nurseries throughout Denver Metro. To do this, Kelly recruited some volunteers to help make the calls. As one of those volunteers, I'm gonna share with you what I've learned. On my first day of calling, I became aware of a problem. A given nursery might tell me that they didn't use pesticides, but the fact that they didn't grow any or all of the plants they sold made that an incomplete story. When they purchased their nursery stock from a wholesale grower, they had no idea if or with what the plants had been treated before they arrived on their site. So then I began collecting the name of commonly used wholesale growers and the next day I started contacting them. This is where my education really began. I learned that there are many thousands of wholesale growers in the US. That rea reality made it obvious that there was no way we were ever gonna be able to gather the information on pesticide use practices from all of them. 
the task had suddenly become overwhelming. I also learned that there are pesticide laws pertaining to plants crossing state borders. For example, one such law states that any plant in a one gallon or larger pot entering Colorado from any state east of us is required to be soil drenched with a systemic pesticide to prevent the importation of Japanese beetles to our state. I also gained some insight into the issues that must be considered when trying to get pesticides out of the nursery plant industry, such as the fact that growing massive numbers of similar plants in crowded conditions is an ideal setup for pest and disease problems. Growing nursery stock is not a high profit industry. A grower may have best intentions to avoid pesticide use. However, if he or she is plagued by an unexpected infestation which would threaten their ability to stay in business, they may make the difficult decision to treat with pesticides to save their livelihood. Most growers have been trained in a pesticide model of management. I expect that learning a more complicated pesticide-free growing style and changing an entire operational system could be cost prohibitive for the majority of growers. While we would all ideally love to see that transition away from pesticide use, I think it's gonna take some major political and financial incentives to make it happen. Another issue which needs to be explored is the use of seed treatments. Some nurseries buy seeds and grow their own annuals and vegetable starts on site. Many seeds are treated with fungicides or other pesticides which can make a plant toxic to pollinators. When I called one large local seed supplier, the customer service initially tried to tell me how pollinator safe all of their products were, but I had read the website catalog about some seed varieties being treated with a fungicide or other proprietary ingredient coating. As she and I learned together from one of her managers, I could detect her concerned surprise as the manager told us that, quote, people didn't have to worry about the pesticides on the seeds because the pesticide treated seeds were coated with something so that the pesticides wouldn't come in contact with human skin when the seeds were handled. I had to wonder if that rep was able in good conscience to keep her job after our conversation. I do believe that most of the seeds being coated are used in agricultural settings. However, they aren't without problems such as dust arising from the machines while planting the seeds, spreading through the air, contaminating nearby plants which pollinators might visit. And leftover seed frequently ends up being converted to biofuel which further spreads the toxins throughout the environment. I didn't find any nursery owners who were aware of or asking questions about seed treatments. In addition to seeds, some nursery stock items are started from plant cuttings. These frequently originate in Central America. One popular name brand wholesale supplier to the French Front Range advertises on their website that their plants are neonicotinoid free. However, when I questioned the CEO, he admitted that while his Costa Rican cuttings were neonic free, after he potted them up and sent them off to 8,000 growers around the country to be grown into nursery stock products, he had no idea what was being applied to them, even though they eventually would come to market under his brand name. Another CEO of a popular brand of plants sold in Colorado went so far as to tell me that, quote, if I wanted non-toxic plants that I should just buy my plants from Harlequins. This brings up the issue of greenwashing I realize that we must be very wary when we see advertisements for products which are labeled neonicotinoid free or neonic free, as industry understands that people are becoming aware of the toxic nature of these systemic compounds and they're trying to avoid them. Unfortunately, there are a couple of equally pollinator toxic systemic pesticides which actually persist longer in the environment than any of the neonics. The use of these other systemic pesticides has skyrocketed in recent years to make up for the use of fewer neonics. So beware of any advertisement which boasts neonic free as the plant may in reality have been poisoned with another toxic systemic such as cyanotronilaprol or flupiridifurone. Given all of this information and the uncertainty surrounding the treatment of plants in the nursery trade, we've come up with remediation strategies to help consumers mitigate the potential contamination to nursery plants with an uncertain history of pesticide exposure. 
When you bring home a new nursery plant and you're uncertain of its exposure history, the remediation process is to first remove the potting soil from the plant's roots and toss the soil in the trash, not in anyone's compost pile because it might be toxic. You could go as far as to rinse the roots before planting if you want to be very thorough. Second, for the first season, remove any blossoms from the plant as systemic pesticides are taken up through the roots and contaminate every cell in the plant, including leaves, flowers, pollen, and nectar. This can cause harm to pollinators and wildlife feeding on any part of the plant. Third, if you want to go the extra mile, you can cover the entire plant for its first season to prevent anything from feeding on it. Because of the prevalence of systemic pesticide use in the nursery trade, we also encourage people to do the following. Patronize nurseries and organize plant sales, which guarantee a clean supply chain. Grow your own native plants from seed. Exchange extra plants with friends and neighbors. Attend plant swaps sponsored by groups such as PPAN, Front Range Wild Ones, and the Colorado Native Plant Society. Lastly, uh, People and Pollinators Network will be including these guidelines along with Kelly's 2022 Be Safe Nursery Guide in your follow-up email, as well as posting them on their website. And thank you all for your interest and positive actions pertaining to this subject. Thank you so much, Laurel. I, I'm sure many people are going to be surprised to hear about the research you've done, and we appreciate it. And now I'd like to, again, welcome Jax from Remedy Permaculture. Jax, take it away. All right, I've got it. Thank you so much, Joyce. And yeah, I want to second everyone's uh, testament. I'm so grateful to see how many people are interested in this topic. So thank you so much for showing up. But my topic today is to cover the basics of creating a habitat for pollinators and birds. So, and my name is Jax McRae. And I think you were able to see the topics and that's really all that I was going over. And what I was just saying is that one of the things I really love and hate about permaculture is that if you were to ask 20 permaculturists how to define it, you would get 20 different answers. And the way that we like to best define it is that permaculture is an integrative design system that observes and mimics nature to meet the needs and desires of humans while consciously regenerating the lands and waterways around us. And I've also included a quote from Starhawk, who was my permaculture teacher. Uh, she's a longtime permaculturist and just a real activist for the earth. And what she has to say is that permaculture has three basic, basic ethics, care for the earth, care for people, and care for the future. It's a set of principles that directs us to observe natural systems and mimic the way they work. Here's the best part. Permaculture favors low-tech solutions that empower ordinary people like each of us to take responsibility for their own needs and impacts. Our goal is more than sustainability. We work for abundance, regeneration, and healing. So we're going to go over some of the basics of design. And the first absolute step is getting to know your own land. So we integrate permaculture principle number one in this, which is to observe and interact. This is something that is so different from how we typically approach landscaping and gardening. Uh, permaculture really recommends observing your land for at least one whole year before placing any permanent features. And that relates to trees, hardscaping, water features, all of that kind of thing. And the reason is that this gives you the time that you need to observe any microclimates in your land, the path and patterns of the sun, the waterfall, the different types of soil, and anything that might be unique to your neighborhood, like noise, kids, dogs, foot traffic, all of that kind of thing. And we really need a whole year to observe all of these things because every season is different and presents its own unique needs and potential challenges. So this is something extremely difficult to do in the professional design world, but for you as a homeowner, this is something that you can really enjoy. It's a process of getting to know your land and building a relationship with it. The information that we gather from this year of observation is absolutely essential to move forward in creating a better, more efficient and abundant design that will stand the test of time. 
what we're really trying to do here is create an ecosystem that after a few years will need minimal impact from us and really can kind of take on a life of its own. So we will skip forward to permaculture design principle number seven, which is to design from patterns to details. And this is also something that feels really important to cover because it is different than how we typically landscape, where we want to focus on the details. You know, what plants are we going to plant? You know, where are we going to plant them? But what this is teaching us is that first, before we can even begin to look at any of those details, we really need to observe any patterns um, on our land. And patterns are everywhere. Once you see them, you'll start to see them everywhere. And a good example of a macro pattern is the seasons. That is a pattern that happens every year that we can count on, and it may look different from year to year, but it's a pattern that we can follow. And I'm curious if anyone wants to throw in the chat any other examples that come to mind for them of a big pattern, a macro pattern. I also realize that I can't see anyone's answers. <laughs> Bear with me. I spend my time in the dirt, not, not as much on the computer. Oh, fabulous. Thank you, yeah. Joyce. So we've got lunar cycle and wind, path of sun, climate yes. change. Yes, I love that. Those are all so right. Um, yes, and I was going to say something similar, um, as well as a river course, you know, where water flows. That's another branching pattern that we'll get into more details about. And what about if we zoom in and we look at the patterns that are most obvious to us and most small? Does anyone have any examples of a micro pattern? Uh, Pam said, P Pamela says drainage can be macro or micro. And then we've Indeed. got animals. And some others that were posted. Um, well, that was was this was more the macro. The ocean currents, birds where they collect and nest, path of ants to and from their mound. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you. Those are so creative and all so right. I really love those examples. And a few more that I was going to add about micro patterns that I really love is the pattern of a leaf which when we get to the next page, we'll look at the branching pattern. And um, in fact, let's just go ahead and look at this. So this is such a cool image because you can see in the middle, we've got the leaf and this is the branching pattern, which the branching pattern, its most, um, its most effective purpose is to connect and disperse energy, food and materials in the most efficient pattern. And essentially what it's doing is taking big things and moving them through the system so that they get all the way down to the small things. And as you can see in this photo, we've got the branching pattern of a leaf on the micro. And then we've got the image of the entire tree which follows the exact same pattern. This pattern can also be seen in the waterways, as you can see in the upper right hand corner, the roots of a tree, which go down into the earth and spread those nutrients down. And then of course our lungs is also a great example of the branching pattern. So this is just one example of a pattern. There's so many other in permaculture, there's waves and um, it, I really recommend looking into it, but the branching pattern is one that I think you can really enjoy now that you've got it and you'll see it everywhere and it just, it helps me feel more at home in nature because I recognize it and I'm building a relationship with it. So it's great to talk about patterns in the abstract and then how do we actually bring that into our garden design? Here's a few examples. Plan paths by where people want to walk. This seems like a no brainer, but often we can think, oh, a path would look nice there, but is there a point to it? Does it bring a big thing to a small thing? Does it disperse energy and nutrients? You know, what's the purpose of the pattern of the path and where would it best serve? And like someone pointed out, the pattern of the sun, this is a great one to really observe that. Then you can plan your garden accordingly. You can plant shade tolerant things where there's less sun, sun hardy things right in the middle where the sun is the hottest, things like that. And I included this other example because this is a way that we can apply permaculture to our life and a more 
in a more personal way. And this is something I've been implementing in my own life, which is to plan my day around my own patterns. For example, I know I like to eat breakfast mid-morning and I like to take a nap in the afternoon if my day goes as planned. That's a pattern I've noticed in myself. And the more I can build my life around a pattern that works for me, that's permaculture. So moving on to another permaculture principle as it relates to design is to integrate rather than separate. I imagine a lot of you are familiar with this one, but it's really an important one. So I wanted to highlight it. And what we're really looking at here is the connections. So not only are each element, is each element important, but the connection between the elements is just as important. And so what we're trying to do as we create a design for our garden, we want it to be functional, we want it to be long lasting. And what we're trying to do here is place each element in a way so that every element is both giving and receiving with the other elements around it. Let's go into an example of that. So here's a few um, broader term examples of that, which is planting in polycultures, you know, doing companion planting, planting things that go well together and support each other. I'll share an example of that in the next slide. Um, integrating animals, if you have that capability. Uh, seeking diversity, and this means, sure, we love, uh, say, sunflowers. They're my favorite flower. Sometime, and maybe a few years ago, I would have planted 100 different sunflowers, but now I know Yes, sunflowers, but also asters, also coneflowers, also columbines, these kind of things, also grasses, also shrubs, these kind of things to create more diversity because as we all know, the more diverse a habitat is, the stronger and more resilient the habitat is. If one year our service berry doesn't produce, the current will, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of benefits to integrating our garden in this way. One is that we're using all the layers and that relates to a multi-story approach, which I'll, which I'll get into when we get into the habitat creation. It, super, it supports multiple functions. It really increases, like I said, the resiliency, the dynamicism, as well as the beauty. So here's a great example of an integrative companion planting method. Um, this is the Three Sisters. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. And this, um, this system goes back further than we really ever know. The Iroquois tribes use this planting method, the Hopi, the Diné, and probably so many other tribes that we don't know about have been using this for eons. And what this is, is the Three Sisters planting corn, beans, and squash. Okay, fabulous. So yes, the squash is the last thing that you plant and the squash provides a living mulch. It shades the ground, it helps the soil stay wet. And it's just like the most complete planting there could be. And the other cool thing about the Three Sisters is that the Iroquois knew even back in the day that this was a complete food system. So the beans and the corn together provide a complete amino acid profile. So you get everything you need. The corn also provides nutrients, minerals, so does the beans, and then the squash is extremely nutrient dense. So pe these people were able to sustain an extremely healthy diet with these three foods being the staple. Pretty incredible. So to sum up our design portion of the talk, uh, I wanted to end it with this great quote by David Holmgren, who's one of the co-founders of the modern permaculture movement. And he says that good design depends on a free and harmonious relationship between nature and people, in which careful observation and thoughtful interaction provide the design inspiration. I just love this quote because it really speaks to the relationship building and that's really at the heart of what we're doing here. We're getting to know our land as if it was our neighbor, you know, and we're really starting to build a relationship, learn how to listen, learn what the land needs, and have a dialogue about it. So let's move on now to the elements of creating a habitat. So I got a lot of these um, pieces from the Audubon Society. As you all know, they're a fantastic resource and their Habitat Hero Gardens really are a great framework for how to create a thriving habitat. And it's towards birds, but if we support the birds, we support the pollinator and it's a ecosystem in that way. So first we wanna look at the structure and with the structure of our habitat, we really want to have three stories. 
the, the overstory, which would be our well-established, well-developed trees or planting trees that we know will create the overstory over time. The midstory, which is our shrubs and smaller trees. And then the understory, which is all of our perennial wildflowers and grasses. The second thing we must have, of course, is food for our pollinators and our birds and any other wildlife that comes to dine. And we kind of lump them into five categories. We've got to have caterpillars. And you all know, if anyone follows Douglas Talamy, we know all about the caterpillars. And it's just been groundbreaking to really recognize that if we support them, we support the web. So we want to draw in our caterpillars with our native plants that bring in our native pollinators. We want to have nectar for them. We want to have grain, nuts, and fruit, especially for the birds. Uh, third, of course, we must have water. And it can be as advanced as you want. You know, you could have a pond, which is fabulous, um, or you can have a simple pollinator dish, which is what I had when I lived at my last apartment. And, you know, I had a pollinator dish with some rocks in there, the beads, and then I all had a butterfly puddling dish. Um, and I will attach resources for that too. There's a great little YouTube video on how to create a puddling dish because the butterflies have different water needs than the other pollinators. And uh, number four, this is include habitat description is to eliminate any hazards. You know, the worst thing is to bring everyone to the garden and then poison them. So everything that Laurel was saying about avoiding pesticides, doing our research. Um, we also want to treat windows. Um, and this means there's so many resources um, of putting tape on your windows or different hang things or stickers, that kind of thing, because birds flying into windows is a huge deal. And pollinators. Um, number three, keep cats indoors. This is a big one. Um, cats eat so many birds every year. And then reduce outdoor lighting. Um, this can look as simple as just putting a motion sensor on your outdoor lights. If you feel that you need to have outdoor lights for security, put them on a motion sensor because to have them on all night, who even knows how many moths that's killing. Lastly, stewardship. So considering bat and bird houses, looking at which birds are in our area, how can we support them? Bat definitely needing support as well. Um, and then really doing our research to find out which birds and wildlife and pollinators live in our area so that we're supporting the right people or the right beings. And three, creating a brush pile. This is great. Everyone wants to have somewhere to hide out. And a brush pile can be a really amazing ecosystem in your yard that you have to do nothing to. And lastly, spreading the word, you know, I mean, to things like this, connecting with your community, telling your neighbors what you're doing. We all have so much more power in this than we realize. So let's take that power back and let's spread the word. So going into more details about the habitat structure, I shared with you a little bit earlier about the overstory, the midstory, and the understory. So here's a few examples of what that would really look like in our climate. So the overspray, those trees, those provide nesting sites and food. And some examples of those would be gamble oak, blue spruce, rocky juniper, and pinion pine. Those are great ones for our ecosystem here. Uh, the midstory provides protection and food. And the more that we can kind of create a little thicket in our yard, somewhere where we really don't need to go and don't intend to go, if we have the luxury of that corner, these are all great things to plant in there. A wax currant, a golden, or a clove, any currant will do. Service berries, choke cherries, boulder raspberries, and woods rose. The woods rose especially is a great one that can thick it out, that you can just leave and it just creates so much protection and habitat that our wildlife and pollinators and birds really need. And lastly, the understory, what attracts the insects that we're trying to bring in and the caterpillars. And here's just a few examples. As you all know, there's so many gorgeous native plants and wildflowers in our areas. But these are some of the tried and true ones that we use a lot in our designs that are easy to work with, hardy, and we just love. They also support a ton of native bees which we all know there's 904 species of native bees here. So they really need plants that they've grown up with over eons. And these are a few of the ones that really support them. Blue flax, common yarrow, columbines, lupins, common sunflower, Rocky Mountain bee plant, many of the native asters, and the blue grama grass. So um, the last thing I want to talk about is now, once you've created your garden, the stewardship is really 
the ongoing thing and this coming back to that relationship that I was highlighting. And the permaculture principle that I feel like is most relative to this is using small and slow solutions. This is a principle that I use almost every day in my personal life and in our design work because it just helps make all of this so much more accessible and less daunting. And we don't have to solve all these things in one day. We don't have to create habitat in one day, one year, or even a few. It can really be incremental changes. And those changes allow us to more easily understand and monitor the solutions. That way we can adapt them to our own needs and it allows us to be more respectful of nature. So by keeping things small and slow, we're more likely to see the consequences of our actions and be able to adjust them. This is the reality because no matter how much we know, we're gonna make mistakes. We're having to relearn how to be in right relationship with the earth. And so when we do things in a small way, if we mess up, it's not such a big deal. So I really, if you get anything from it, I would say this is the principle to really take home. And I wanted to end my talk with this amazing quote that I love by Toby Hemingway. And he wrote the book, Gaia's Garden. If you haven't read it, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It was the first book I ever read about permaculture and it changed my entire life. And what he says is that permaculture gives us a toolkit for moving from a culture of fear and scarcity to one of love and abundance. Isn't that what we're trying to create? Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Turn it over to Aaron now. Hi, thank you for uh, joining on the uh, webinar today and thank you for having me. And I'm excited to share about the wellness benefits of native plant and pollinator gardening. Let me just Aaron Michael with my company, Earth Love Gardens. And we create native plant, pollinator and bird friendly landscape designs, raised vegetable garden beds and hoop houses so you can grow year-round in your vegetable garden beds. We've been creating eco-friendly gardens since 2018, and we have hundreds of happy clients abundantly growing for themselves and the environment. The mission of Earth Love Gardens has always been about facilitating people to authentically connect within themselves, each other, and the earth. And together, we are creating and realizing a world where everyone lives in harmony with the earth. Earth Love Gardens also is a partner with the Audubon Rockies and their Habitat Hero Garden Program. Like uh, Remedy for Permaculture Design, we follow the guidelines of the program and we can design and certify your landscape to be an Audubon certified garden, uh, Habitat Hero Garden. So the first thing I wanna talk about is connecting with nature. As we are part of nature, the disconnect for society at large has created can require a simple solution to, re to reconnect with nature. Thus again, as we are part of nature, we are reconnecting with ourselves. This can be through a walk or a hike on a trail, playing and laying in the grass, taking a dip in water, or what brings us all here together today, gardening, including native plants for pollinators. Connecting with nature and gardening has countless health benefits, including lowered stress, depression, and anxiety, better mood, life satisfaction, a sense of community, physical health, a deeper sense of connection, and much more. I also wanna add that I've been reading a book called Evolutionary Herbalism, by uh, Saja Popham, and he further goes into the importance of reconnecting with and living from our hearts instead of from our heads. And I aim to always live this way, uh, and in my passion and purpose in sharing this concept is why I called my company Earth Love Gardens. In living from your heart, you also connect with the heart of the earth and open yourself to the infinite language of life, which transcends spoken language. Grounding or earthing is a simple premise of taking your shoes off and connecting with the ground under your feet. This can be as simple as having your feet on the grass in the backyard or working in the garden, tending to your plants without shoes on. Studies have shown that grounding stabilizes the physiology at the deepest levels, reduces inflammation, pain and stress, improves blood flow, energy and sleep, and generates greater well-being. For me, it's hard to explain, but having my feet on the ground makes me feel whole and complete not needing to complicate things with worldly things and complications. Also, soil has a, a healthy bacterium that may stimulate serotonin production, which makes you relax and help happier. And this is all by touching and breathing in the soil particles as you're simply working with it. This study had been uh, completed by a scientist named Dr. Lowry from CU Boulder. And in his study, the lab rats uh, further showed that the benefits of touching the soil could continue for about three weeks. Birds make us happier. 
A study has found that biological diversity, especially from birds, can increase people's life satisfaction as much as you would if making extra money or perhaps experiencing less inflation. The study found that a 10% increase in the number of bird species in people's surroundings increased their life satisfaction as much as 10% of extra money in the bank. I found this to be true a few months ago when I heard bird chirp, chirp, birds chirping outside my window and I just felt happier hearing the birds. If you want to attract uh, more birds and live a happier life, native plants are a great way to attract them. Besides, for hummingbirds, they could all use a little less refined sugar from the red water feeder in their lives. Native plants that attract poll insect pollinators also attract birds as birds eat the insects. Additionally, plants also provide seeds and fruits that the birds eat directly. It is great to also include a water feature like Jax had mentioned in your landscape, as simple as a bird bath for birds to drink clean and cool, some, cool themselves off. Additionally, putting some stones in your bird bath can help visiting bees and butterflies not drown when they are taking a drink. A birdhouse can also be help, a birdhouse can also be helpful for providing shelter for cavity nesting species. The Denver Audubon has a great resource for a list of native plants for birds as well as pollinators found at the link on the slide. Also to add, if you are going to attract birds to your landscape, like Jax has mentioned, it's great to add at least a reflective window film sticker to prevent uh, bird strikes to your windows. So here are a few great plants for birds and pollinators. Um, one first includes red osier dogwood, which has recorded 98 different visiting bird species. It has nectar rich flowers pollinated by many species of bees, wasps, and butterflies. And the red twigs of the dogwood provide cover for birds in the winter. And the plant looks great for winter interest in your landscape. Black eyed Susan, in addition to insects for birds to eat, also provides seeds. It is pollinated by bees, monarch butterflies, and other pollinators. Columbine, including the Rocky Mountain Columbine pictured here, can attract orioles, thrashers, sparrows, and many other birds. It also attracts bumblebees, hawk moths, and hummingbirds, which are also pollinators. These are just a very few of the many plants that provide habitat for birds and pollinators. The previous plant list from the Deborah Audubon again, is a great resource for such plants. And I also want to add that Rocky Mountain Pencilman is great for pollinators, including hummingbirds, which I saw enjoying uh, at the Boulder Library Native Plant Demonstration Garden a few weeks ago as I was working on it. Medicinal benefits of native plants. In addition to serving pollinators and birds, native plants provide direct benefits to people. The native people knew this wisdom, and it's great knowledge for us to know about the simple remedies available in your own pollinator garden. Also, from an herbalism perspective, in addition to just taking, in addition to just taking from the plants, see if you can just peacefully sit and connect with them, which is an emotional and spiritual experience that goes beyond the physical healing properties these plants can provide. Coneflower or echinacea has been shown to improve immunity, blood sugar, anxiety, inflammation, and skin health. It's been it's been known to be used in teas and extracts, and you make you can make your own with the flowers, leaves, and roots of the plant. Our native bee balm, Monarda fistulosa, uh, can help treat colds, headaches, stomach aches, stress, and act as a balm for bee stings, hence the name. Yarrow can help with cramps, fevers, toothaches, skin itching, rashes, and more, which fun fact, you can also plant yarrow as a low maintenance, low water lawn substitute for grass. And there are many native uh, varieties of goldenrod which its Latin name, solidago, actually means to make whole. Uh, goldenrod has been used to treat wounds, used as a diuretic, help with diabetes, uh, enlargement of the liver, gout, hemorrhoids, internal bleeding, asthma, arthritis, and more. So many, uh, in addition to uh, feeding pollinators, native plants also people. Many plants are native, made of here some of the tastier varieties. Service berry, such as Utah or Saskatoon service berry, has sweet berries that I actually really enjoy eating. Birds also are attracted to the berries. Bees also pollinate the service berries. Wax currant has slightly sweet fruits. Golden currants have a sweet tart taste, which somehow is reminiscent to bacon and waffles. Wild plum grows plums that taste tart and sweet, and they're sometimes bitter. 
Another native plant, the creeping Oregon grape, has edible berries, but I find you need to be a bit hungrier than normal to find their berries tasty. Here's some pictures of the native plants uh, that I mentioned, including the service berry, the wax currant, and the wild plum. In addition to these points, I also wanted to throw in some native plant gardening wisdom that I've collected in the past few years of working with these plants. Um, so I've noticed that wood mulch rarely occurs in nature. So plants, um, plants including what you would call non-native weeds, will almost always fill open spaces in your yard, uh, especially in a home garden where the soil is usually ripe for growing. You can consider native, adding native low growers and ground covers to fill in bare spots and help choke out these non-natives, such as blue grama grass, which is best in full sun, which you can also mix with blue, um, with, with buffalo grass or use buffalo grass by itself to replace your non-native turf grass and make a native grass prairie for your yard. With the native grass as a base layer, you can then plant perennials for a very natural prairie meadow look. Get some water. Creeping Oregon grape is best in shade, although you can grow them in sunnier spots, but the leaves can appear more purple than green. Pussy toast, which is best in full sun and hard shade, um, is another option. And as mentioned before, you can also plant yarrow, which yarrow prefers the, sun, the full sun. To note, planting such low growers will not completely eliminate the non-native weeds, but make them less prominent as you choose the plants that get planted and that get to survive in your landscape as you continue to work on and maintain it. Here's an example of a hell strip or the parking strip that utilizes a lot of blue grama grass plugs within its wildscape. And here are some uh, native ground cover examples, including a turf grass that was mixed with blue grama grass and buffalo grass, um, and it comes out beautiful. And again, you can plant wildflowers within it and it gives it real natural wild prairie look. And then creeping Oregon grape, uh, which I saw on my walk, which makes a very beautiful lush ground cover. And again, you can use it in the shade. So um, in the Boulder Public Library uh, demonstration garden, which I designed and then installed with some awesome people, um, out of over 20 native plants, the fastest growing plant has been the Rocky Mountain penstemon the Penstemon strictus. They say first they sleep, then they creep, then they leap regarding each season of newly planted native plants, but the Penstemon was, but the penstemon was already leaping when it was only time for creeping. I have found that Kinnikinnik often does not grow well east of the foothills. If you have part shade the full sun, you can consider the alternative Panchita manzanita for your garden. Its blooms also serve pollinators. It's also a great low grower, low grower so if you plant them together, they can form a great uh, evergreen ground cover. If you do have an area that's mostly shade, again, creeping or grape truly makes a beautiful ground cover. And lead plant is a highly recommended plant in permaculture uh, as it's a nitro nitrogen fixer, uh, or it creates readily available nitrogen that helps nearby plants grow. You can utilize lead plant to boost the growth and health of the plants nearby it. It also happens to be a native to Colorado and attracts pollinators, including bees, butterflies, and birds. As an alternative to the often planted Russian sage, uh, the Front Range Wild Ones also highly recommends lead plant. And here are the pictures of these plants, including the Rocky Mountain Penstemon, the Pantino Manzanita, and lead plant. Thank you for uh, allowing me to share, and uh, feel free to connect with us at earthlovegardens.com or you can send me an email at aaron at earthlovegardens.com and I'd love to further answer any questions you may have after the webinar. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aaron. I can attest to your penstemon example, uh, although it's great when you've pulled up your turf and the penstemon really on the third year has filled in beautifully. So great, great practical examples. Appreciate that. I, the first was asking about harvesting the three sisters with today's agriculture, since machines can only harvest one. And, you know, I, I guess I'll let Jax, you take that since you address the three sisters. However, 
yeah, it probably doesn't work in conventional monoculture agriculture. But if you have any comments, Jax, I'll let you take that one. You summed it up, but I'll definitely expand and expound on that. That yeah, that's true. I mean, this presentation is definitely geared towards a homeowner creating a home habitat. Oh, my Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, it's a little. It's a little break. Okay, I'm in my camera. Okay. Um, I'll do my best. I'll talk slow. Yes, three sister is not something practiced for industrial agriculture. However, there are a lot of ways that permaculture principles can apply to industrial agriculture. Um, but that's a different conversation uh, for another time. So yeah, three sister would be best to be planted at home. Okay. The next was asking about the treatment for ash trees, and I assume uh, the person's referring to amactin benzoate, um, and probably just the concern of using that in ash trees uh, to pollinators. And that's a that would probably take a really involved answer. It's complicated. Uh, there is a feeling that we are eventually going to lose the majority of our ash trees. So I think cities are developing programs and it varies from place to place where they're strategically treating some trees because we don't want to lose all the trees at once. Um, that's about as much as I want to tackle at this point, but certainly um, something worth considering. I am personally not treating my ash trees because I know that they will die eventually when the emerald ash borer hits Denver. Uh, there was a question about a brush pile. Uh, Jax, do you want to just explain what a brush pile is? Yes, definitely. Brush piles are fabulous. It is a way to, when if say the snow knocks some branches down or you're pruning your trees and you've got all these branches, instead of taking them off site, you can literally put them in a pile in a corner where you don't plan to go of your yard and they create an instant habitat for birds and other wildlife. Uh, the person who answered asked the question about the brush pile. I may uh, point this your way, Laurel, this question. Uh, someone purchased expensive buffalo grass seed, which they now realize is probably coated with some kind of pesticide. Does soaking the seeds before planting remove the pesticides? I don't know about soaking to remove the pesticide. I would probably contact the source of the seed and just question them. Uh, I don't think in general grass seed is targeted for treatment, um, but I would contact the supplier. Good advice. Okay, question about butterfly weed for monarchs in Northern California. I have read some negative things about this plant online. It seems perhaps the danger is only more in tropical areas. However, I've had monarch caterpillars feeding on this plant last year and saw chrysalises hatched. Therefore, I planted some more of this type of milkweed this spring. And I think the it's the S, the tuberosa version of the S, the S. Um, I think that's an okay one, is it not? Yeah, I just looked it up as well. It's native to Colorado uh, and the Southeast. Uh, it just like ends in Colorado, but I haven't heard anything otherwise that you couldn't use it. In fact, the garden in the box program includes it in their native plant package, so. Yeah, right, I think, I think okay. there's a butterfly uh, bush or weed, just referring to the common name, there is one that's on the uh, noxious weed list. So just be um, careful to check the Latin name. And that's why it's important to use Latin names. Is blue grama grass and buffalo grass combo hardy enough for dog traffic? This person has three big dogs. Um, they're trying to get away from too much water use though. Any awareness of that, those, those types of grasses? It's not that good for high traffic areas. Uh, yeah, uh, if the dogs occasionally run through the area, I think it would be fine. 
but otherwise um, my theory is when the bison roamed the plains, uh, they would kick up the grass easily and then help the whole soil sequestration you know, process. So uh, yeah, unfortunately it's not great for high traffic areas. Okay, Any rec anything that would be better that would be low water option? I've looked at this a few times and not yet. <laughs> uh, what do you think of the dog tough grass? The, do you know what is in that? I've, I've, I'm not sure. I, I can dog? speak to this. Okay. Go for it. Can you hear me okay? Sounding good. Okay, fabulous. So yeah, so dog tough is actually um, rebranded as African sawtooth grass. So it's definitely not native, but it is very low water and drought tolerant. And um, I have a client that uses it and um, really likes it. And we had to replace some of it. And so I bought a flat from Harlequins. And so far, so good. So that's definitely a good substitute for the dogs because it's well known to be able to handle their foot traffic and their urine. Great, thank you for jumping in on that. One more additional comment on the dog tough. It um, is sterile, so there is no concern about it escaping into the wild and becoming a noxious weed or anything like that. It is sterile. Good to know. Any recommend recommendations for plants to use in pots? We often talk about, you know, if you don't have space in a yard, you can still put out some pollinator plants. Any ideas for that? Uh, yeah, I was sharing in the chat and I'll say it out loud too that um, there's a, so I live in Golden and, and so far that I can tell there's a great nursery nearby me called Plum Creek and I just bought the most amazing basket from them. It's a hanging basket that doesn't have those tired non-native colored flowers that I'm so tired of seeing. This perennial basket has blank flowers, hyssop, I think it's sunset hyssop, and um, bee balm. And they're packed into the hanging basket, like overflowing, and they are thriving. Um, and the coolest thing about it, just a shout out for Plum Creek, is that the basket is actually biodegradable. So come fall, I can plant the basket and have plants for for many years to come. So those three go well in pots, I can say for sure, as well as I also have a dwarf sunflower that I'm growing in pots. So not native, but still a sunflower, birds still love it. And um, that's so far what I have about uh, native plants that you can plant in a pot. Thank you, Jax. Somebody was referring to Talamese online tool. They can't find the plants uh, in their zip code. I did just put um, the tool through the National Wildlife Federation's website, the zip code finder, where you can plug in your zip code and it will put out some plants that are good, native plants that are good. Um, if you're not finding them in your nursery seed companies, that is a, a big problem with native plants. And we wanna make sure that when we're shopping in nurseries that we're asking uh, nurseries to supply more natives, we need to create demand. And that is one of the reasons why we are um, so excited about hosting some native plant swaps just to, have a little more availability until nurseries do start to fill that demand. So it's it, it's an ongoing problem until we can uh, convince nurseries to supply them. And I do see we're coming up here on one o'clock. I will ask our presenters if, if you wanna hang out for another five minutes and see if we work through a few more questions. Definitely. Yeah, so okay. let's sit tight. Anybody that needs to jump off now, we understand. Thank you so much for coming today and we hope to see you next time. If you did sign up for this webinar, uh, you are now on PPAN's e-news list, which is packed full of information about events and resources. We do hope you'll consider donating to PPAN so we can continue bringing you these webinar free webinars someone was asking about how to get rid of aphids and so I just wanted to throw in 
how we would look at that through the lens of permaculture. So rather than trying to apply a product that would get rid of the aphids, the way we would look at it from permaculture is to think, okay, what eats aphids and how do we bring them to the garden? And so um, with that, it's um, so uh, lace wings and ladybugs like to eat aphids. And so uh, you want to attract ladybugs to your garden. Um, you, they really love yarrow. They love coreopsis, um, cosmos, which aren't native, but you can definitely get native coreopsis and yarrow. And then they also are attracted to a lot of um, herbs. So you could plant dill, fennel, caraway, and cilantro. Um, and just the last thing I'll say about that is not only would you be attracting ladybugs to help eat your aphids with those herbs, but also those herbs are known to support um, the caterpillars of quite a few native butterflies in the area. So win, win, win. Right. And then I, I will just add that we also often talk about um, not wanting to use treatment because if you pull out insecticides to treat the aphids, you're going to end up harming beneficial insects as well, which is what Jax is referring to. So we wanna be able to allow the beneficial insects to come in and maintain that balance. Working with HOAs to replace lawn in common areas. That's an area that uh, a group I'm working with, the Colorado Native Landscaping Coalition, is starting to pull together resources for HOAs. Uh, that's a complicated question. There's a lot of HOAs in Colorado. I think there is a way to make changes in what's being planted. One of them is really thinking about reducing um, water use. And I think that that's something in terms of saving money can speak to HOAs. Um, I would say stay tuned on that. It's often important just to get involved in uh, in your HOA so that you can make change. I think that that's often the first most impactful step you can take to educate uh, residents about how removing turf and replacing with um, native plants can save water. Grub X is safe, yes. Um, similar question do you, for Jax, do you recommend certain plants to attract dragonflies or other insects that will eat mosquitoes? Ooh, I love this question. I was just visiting the creek by my house yesterday and there were dragonflies everywhere. But they're so interactive. It was really a special thing. So I'm glad you asked that question. So same thing um, with the dragonflies. We know that they eat small insects and the plants that we can plant that will attract the insects that the dragonflies eat. Uh, a few native examples are black-eyed Susans, um, swamp milkweed, and even the Joe pie weed, um, which is a nice, easy, hardy native plant. Um, those are really good for attracting dragonflies. And water, of course. You have to have a water source. So much, Jax, Laurel, and Aaron for being here and presenting and for everybody for attending. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joyce. Bye. Thank you.